Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm glad you joined us again today. Um, we, I'd like to introduce Dr. Greg Lardy, Vice President of Agricultural Affairs. He's going to um, kick us off this, this afternoon, I guess. So I'll let you go ahead, Greg. Thank you. Robbie, thanks and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for the invitation to, to spend a few minutes with you this afternoon. So Robbie, if it's okay with the group, I think what I'll do is I'll make a few comments uh, relative to kind of our current situation. And then I'd, I'd like to uh, spend some time answering questions that this group might have. And I know there's probably a number of uh, areas that, uh, you know, there's questions surrounding, uh, especially COVID and those sorts of things. So. Um, let's build in a little bit of time for that. So first off, uh, you know, I, I heard uh, they got in the tail end of the discussion here today on uh, the green thumbs and the black thumbs, and that was kind of interesting that we were working the garden this weekend. So uh, it's nice to see a little bit better weather uh, coming here. But uh, you know, yesterday was Administrative Professionals Day. And so on behalf of our uh, administration here and, and my office, I want to thank each of you for the work that you do uh, to uh, assist our uh, staff across the state with all of the activities that they do. It's just uh, really important that uh, these um, professional development activities like this uh, be available and, and help you grow professionally. Uh, but we also want to make sure that we recognize your efforts. And so I guess from my perspective, uh, I want to say a special thank you to each of you for all the work that you do that uh, is many times behind the scenes um, and uh, you know, you're making your, your job in, in some respects is to make other people look good and, and uh, show that they're organized and that sort of thing. So thank you so much for all that you do. I do want to just make a few comments related to COVID and, and uh, I know many of you are probably watching news reports and and so on. Um, obviously, case numbers in North Dakota continue to go up. And so uh, you're probably all aware that Governor Bergen has extended that uh, closing of bars and restaurants and those sorts of gathering places uh, through May 1st. Our extension activities, face-to-face uh, -face activities are uh, postponed through May 15th. We're continuing to evaluate that situation uh, as we go forward here. Uh, and making decisions uh, that will be in, in concert and congruence with uh, any of the executive orders that are coming, guidance that are coming from either CDC or our state of North Dakota as we continue to, to move forward. Uh, our budgets for uh, experiment station and extension are in, are in good shape uh, for this biennium. You know, there's a lot of, I think, concern about what uh, the, the pandemic might do to the state's economy. Uh, it's really too early to tell if you track any of the numbers or listen to any of the, the comments that uh, people are making out of Bismarck. Uh, they really don't have enough data uh, on any of the revenue forecasts yet to really understand uh, fully what the impact might be. But uh, we're, we're in good shape here. Um, we are uh, continuing to monitor that situation uh, as we go forward and, and we'll make any adjustments that we need to accordingly. The president has asked us to um, implement what he described as a hiring chill, which, which essentially means that we just need to be more deliberate uh, in our hiring practices. Uh, some positions uh, may be open or vacant for a bit longer than we, we might have expected uh, in other situations where the, the budget might be a little bit more flush. But uh, he's doing that in order to make sure that uh, we've got plenty of cushion uh, in the event that uh, we have. Uh, some additional budget pressure as we go forward here through the rest of the biennium. So uh, we'll, we will uh, heed his advice and request and uh, we are going to uh, move a bit slower on hiring uh, some of the positions as we move forward with vacancies that occur into the future here. Uh, any of the positions that have been in the queue already uh, that have been in a recruitment phase or been approved for recruitment, uh, we'll continue to finish those out on the timeline that uh, has been described already in the in the uh, recruitment materials, but uh, future positions will we'll take it a bit slower with uh, those vacancies. The president's COVID group is also beginning to discuss uh, what they are terming a, a re-entry plan and, and kind of how uh, from a campus perspective and from a university-wide perspective, uh, when we do get the green light to uh, reopen, uh, what is that going to look like and how are we going to do it and those sorts of things. So I'm in the process now of, 
of uh, forming a, an advisor group within Ag Affairs uh, that will inform me about uh, some of you know the things that we need to consider, uh, both from an extension and a research perspective as we um, move forward and, and make plans to to get back to normal at some point in the future. Um, as you probably know, you know NDSU's uh, made the decision to go all online for their summer classes. Uh, orientation and registration uh, for incoming freshmen and transfer students will be done online this summer through a virtual format. Uh, the, the president fully expects to be uh, back up with face-to-face -face classes, uh, resumption of normal activities this fall. And so we are beginning to, to make plans for, for that. Uh, but I also want to be mindful that, as, as Dr. Fauci would say, uh, we don't make the timeline. The virus makes the timeline. And so I think we're all uh, aware of that. But I think it's important to remember that from the standpoint of the science that we need to have behind the decisions that we make, but also from the standpoint of, of really being mindful of protecting uh, your health and, and the health of those that we serve, the health of those that we work around and certainly want to make sure that we're taking into account uh, any of the, the new scientific information that's coming related to COVID, but also uh, the existing body of literature that's out there just related to infectious disease in general. So, Robbie, with that, uh, I've, I've chewed up a few minutes here, but I uh, really want to spend some time answering questions that people might have. And so, not sure if the best way to do that is to ask people to put them in the chat box or, or we can just take them verbally. I'm comfortable either way, so I'll, I'll let uh, the questions come in here and we'll, we'll answer those. I know this group's not shy. I always tell them, you know, I was teaching class uh, in the, the latter part of my uh, time as a department head, I had a couple of different classes I was teaching, and I always told them that I was just going to be comfortable with the awkward silence that happens, and I, I can sit and wait for the questions to come in. Okay, I can't stand it anymore. <laughs> See, I need I need somebody would speak up. Go ahead, Jody. <laughs> I'm an interloper in here, um, but I'll I'll ask a question based on the article I saw in the forum today about budgetary issues, and that um, the state obviously is in great shape so far, and if um, if extension has had their budget allocated, I I don't know if that's appropriate term, but I know nothing is definite. But if you've already had your budget from the last um, legislative session, is it safe to say that we're safe for this year? Yeah, great, or, great question. Yeah, great question, Jody. Um, so we we operate on a biennial budget process. So our our biennial uh, budget began uh, July 1, 2019, uh, and the full amount for that biennial budget was allocated to us at that point in time. One of the things that's important to remember though is that the governor does have the authority uh, to, to call for what is termed an allotment. Uh, and, and essentially what that means is that he can ask state agencies to turn back a percentage of their biennial budget uh, if it's deemed necessary uh, for the state to continue to function from a financial standpoint. Um, and one of the, the key things to remember is that that allotment process actually allows the governor then to access uh, one of those rainy day buckets in Bismarck, which is called the Budget Stabilization Fund. So there's currently about $720 million in the Budget Stabilization Fund. In order for the governor to access any of that money, uh, he would need to call back 2.5% of every state agency's uh, biennial budget. So we, we are in very good shape from that standpoint. If, if, if in fact they were to call for a, a two and a half percent allotment, uh, you know, while it would uh, further slow up our hiring processes, it wouldn't result in a hiring freeze or a, uh, anything like that. 
you know, the, the fact that we've uh, really not been able to expend travel dollars and uh, some of those sort of things over the last month means that we're already accruing uh, dollars that we'd normally be spending. Uh, so that's a, another plus in the event that that does occur. Um, so I, I would, I, I just want to reassure the group that, uh, you know, that's the process that would potentially uh, take place if the governor were to call for, for that allotment. Um, but uh, at this point, you know, we're well prepared for it, so. Thanks for the explanation, appreciate that. You're welcome. Let's see, this is from Becky. Quite a few of today's participants are county paid. What kind of influence does NDSU have on funding county support staff? So um, I think the important thing to remember from a, your county budget perspective and, and the difference between county and state budgets is really um, in large part driven by the source of tax revenue that, that uh, is, is part of that equation. So on the state side, uh, almost the entirety of the budget is derived from either uh, income taxes or uh, oil taxes on oil production. So I, I think one of the reasons why the governor's concerned about the state budgets obviously is, is uh, what's happening uh, in oil country now with the price of oil and so on. From a county budget perspective, uh, the lion's share of the tax revenue at the county level is generated through property taxes. And so um, while I'm not an expert in, in county tax policy, uh, I do know that our county partners uh, are in strong financial positions and you know, the tax base is uh, in large part uh, related to property taxes, which uh, are based on valuations. And so you know, we're, we continue to expect the counties to be in a strong position uh, relative to their uh, financial standpoint. Uh, as as they move forward here, and certainly, you know, we look to um, the the uh, partnerships that we have with counties uh, include uh, counties providing uh, that uh, secretarial and administrative support staff, office support, etc., uh, along with half of the salary for our, our extension agents. So that's an important uh, consideration and, and maybe a nuance that uh, needs to be uh, thought about as you think about how. Uh, the difference between county paid staff and state paid staff might might appear. Other questions that you might have. You know, we are um, also continuing to discuss uh, you know, things like 4-H camps and, and those sorts of things. Uh, we're expecting um, our 4-H program to have some recommendations on how they want to proceed with 4-H uh, camps at Western 4-H camp at Washburn here in the next couple of weeks. Um, so we're, you know, continuing to monitor that situation. I think the other thing that many of uh, the folks in county positions might be thinking about is, you know, what is this going to mean for our county fairs and really you know, while, while Extension's a, a major participant in the county fair, uh, county fairs are gonna make their own decisions relative to whether or not uh, they can reopen based on the guidance that uh, will be provided by uh, CDC, North Dakota Department of Health and, and uh, the governor's office. So uh, that's a decision that's really gonna be up to local officials uh, on, on how they can proceed with uh, larger group gatherings like that. I know there is uh, other states, uh, certainly a, an effort, I think, to try to figure out how they might make uh, some of those fair activities virtual and, and those sorts of things. Um, but, uh, you know, at this point, uh, I haven't received any notifications that any, any particular county fairs have been canceled or postponed, but uh, that, that could be a, an eventuality here, depending on how long uh, we need to maintain social distance and that sort of thing. Sherilyn wants to know, as we adjust to working at home and programming virtually, et cetera, how do you see this impacting the future programming that extension will do as we come through this time? You know, Geraldine, one thing I think that uh, I've noticed already is that uh, we've become much more adept at actually doing uh, virtual meetings. I, I can't count the number of virtual meetings I've been involved in in the last month, uh, several a day. And, uh, you know, the, the different groups I work with, uh, at first it was very awkward, um, 
you know, bringing groups together like this. And now, uh, by and large, it's it's really become second nature for most of us to just, you know, jump on a Zoom call, do a Microsoft Teams event. Uh, and I think our clientele and our constituents are also becoming more adept at that. I think one of the things we have to watch out for, though, is there, there are uh, demographics that we serve uh, across the state that uh, are not able to access high quality, high speed internet access. Uh, and so uh, I think we're gonna see as we come back into this, uh, once the pandemic is through, uh, more of a blended approach where we're probably gonna have more programs that we do in a combination where it might be, some of it's offered virtually, some of it might be offered face-to-face. -face. I think we're discovering some situations where face-to-face might actually work better and we reach a different audience. Uh, but I think we have audiences that uh, are gonna wanna go back to a face-to-face -face delivery method uh, in some form or fashion or demographics where we're gonna need to be face-to-face -face with them in order to do uh, obviously some of the activities that we'd like to do with them, but that's a great question. Other questions that you have? I don't know, Robbie, I can't remember how much time we had blocked here, uh, but I'm happy to stay on if there's additional questions, but I won't delay it either if there's not. Does anybody have any more questions for him at all or? Well, I know you guys have done a great job at keeping everyone informed and I'm sure you've been swamped with meetings, so appreciate everything that you well, do for us. You know, what, I, what I'd offer is uh, certainly if you have additional questions, uh, things that you'd like to you know, have an answer to or things that you think we should be communicating more about, um, feel free to reach out to um, myself uh, just through an email or, or if you want to do it through uh, the, the local staff that you're working with and, and have them forwarded on to me. I'm happy to, to I'll look for those answers or try to provide answers to your questions that you might have as well. So Robbie, if I could leave the group with uh, just a, a closing thought here, you know, I think uh, as, we, as we look to this pandemic, certainly uh, one of the things that I've seen is that, you know, our, our employees and, and the support staff that work with them have really been innovative in, in uh, dealing with this and, and trying to make adjustments uh, to uh, continue to, to provide a very, very high level of service. And so I'm just so thankful for the opportunity to work uh, in an organization, lead an organization that uh, values uh, that sort of innovation and, and allows people some flexibility. But I also want to just uh, say a special thank you again to each and every one of you. Uh, you know, this administrative professionals uh, day yesterday, fitting time for us to be together virtually and uh, just uh, think about uh, us continuing to develop professionally and, and uh, work on some additional skills. I think if anything, this pandemic is teaching us uh, the need for patience and, and uh, to, to roll with the punches and, and to do some things differently than we've, we've done in the past, in, in part because we have to. Uh, and this is a new way of working for many of us that, uh, like I said earlier, uh, it's probably very awkward, cumbersome to start with, but we're getting better at it. Every time we do it, we get better at it and we learn some things about how to better use the technology and, and where it makes the most sense to use it. So uh, I just want to, again, extend a thank you to each of you for participating in this conference and, and, uh, and uh, all the work that you're doing. So thanks again. Uh, much appreciated for everything you do. So have a great afternoon. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, um, next up we have Jody Bruins and Deb Thayer. They're gonna be giving a session on um, mini, mini, mini seven habits. <laughs> mini, mini is right. Mini, mini. <laughs> <laughs> so we're taking a two day training, in some cases three, and we'll put it in about 45, 50 minutes. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's all good. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. I, you know, I wish I could, see all of you and you know it's been fun to do some training with all of you at your at your 
annual events you get together with. Um, and so when Deb and I talked about this, um, so I'll back up a minute. Deb and I did this full session the first week in March. That sound right? So I'm curious. So we are going to interject a few of these dynamics of Zoom today. So I hope you're willing to play along. Um, so on the bottom, you should be able to see reactions. You see the chat. And you, um, so if you've gone through seven habits, would you give us a thumbs up? If you put your cursor on the reactions on the bottom toolbar, there you go, Cindy Olson, Heather. Okay, good job. Trying to see where everybody's at. So if you've gone through seven habits, give us a thumbs up. Okay, nice. Okay, so for some of you, you've just heard this. Um, for others, it's been a while. Um, and so Deb and I have just decided to just scratch the surface a little bit. We've had a lot of requests to review this, do some kind of like a second act of Seven Habits. And um, it's really not supported through the Stephen Covey Foundation, where the materials originally came from. So we'll do our best here today. Deb, any, you wanna offer anything else? Well, you know, I have been through this lots of times when we facilitated it, and so I, I'm, I'm just glad we're doing it again because there's a couple of things in preparing I had to review again. So it's constant growth. Right. I appreciate what Dr. Lardy said too. I mean, we're all learning. Um, I know the first week was like almost sheer terror. Like, what do we do, right? Um, and so we've all had to learn to work differently and be flexible. And I think that's a great segue into um, the topic we're going to talk about here today is seven habits and um, making minor changes um, to get big to big um, to shift your paradigm and so we'll talk about those things today so um, for the next 45 minutes uh, we ask you to keep an open mind and if you have something to offer please um, put something in the chat or we will try you know don't don't hesitate to offer a comment if you, if you have something to share, okay? So with that, we're gonna do our best to work with the PowerPoint and um, video, and we're gonna try to do some breakout rooms too. So bear with us, we'll do our best, okay? So I'm gonna start to share the screen here. Okay, Deb, what are we seeing? We're good, we see the slide. All right, we're in business. Okay, so again, welcome to Seven Habits. Um, a couple things I would mention to you, so Deb and I both have the Seven Habits app with, um, I'll just point that out as a, just a resource. Um, we have copies of the book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, if anybody's interested. Um, we don't expect you to change your behavior, in a, in a one hour program, but it's up to you to be that change you wish to see in the world. And sometimes taking a look in the mirror is a bitter pill to swallow, but sometimes um, maybe we're contributing to ineffective issues that we're seeing in our life. So keep an open mind, be willing to share if, if you have something to offer, okay? Okay, so by living the seven habits, you will become profoundly more effective in the things that matter most to you in your work and personal life, okay? according to this, Dr. Stephen Covey. Um, the essence of effectiveness is that you get the results you want today in such a way that you can get even better results in the future. So um, in our workbook, which I know you don't have in front of you, for most of you probably don't, um, so the question often is, is why effective instead of efficiency? Um, we always try to do more with less, um, take on more tasks, do more with less time. Um, and Dr. Covey really thinks about success as, um, although effective, tend to, to enjoy more success. It's about the effectiveness, the ability 
to get desired results again and again in a sustainable manner. So we can rush around and hurry and take more things on. And um, as I said, that was probably the first week of this pandemic is I initially thought, what will I do with all of my time? And all of a sudden I thought, when will I ever have enough time to get everything done that needs to be done? <laughs> it's like we were in crisis mode and um, some things got shuffled around. So I really thought about the seven habits and how can I be most effective? I can't do everything, but to do some prioritizing and Deb will talk about that in a few minutes. So again, um, like I said, we kind of picked and, and choo chose some things that we thought would have the most benefit. Um, and so um, we oftentimes think about paradigms. I'm sure you've often um, heard about that term, what that is. Um, and so, whoops, sorry. so in this particular diagram, you'll see paradigms are what you see, okay? And because of, um, because of what you see or how you were raised or who you were raised by, what kind of home you were in, um, is how you act, the practices, okay? What you do. And as a result of those two, it's what you get, okay? So I'm just gonna read something here. So paradigms can be incomplete or limiting, or they can be more complete and freeing. Can you think about that? Are we, are we stifled by the paradigms in which we are familiar with, okay? Um, they can detract from the results you want or aid your ability to get the results you want. You can have paradigms about yourself, others, or the world in general, okay? I think this is awfully important in proceeding with seven habits or in any task that you do in thinking about um, maybe doing work differently. Um, I did a, some of you maybe saw the, um, the short program, uh, the video clip I did on mind mapping. And, you know, for some, some of you have said, um, you know, I already do that, I write lists. Well, it's not lists. Mind mapping is not lists. It's thinking differently. It is a paradigm shift. And lists work great. I'm a total list person. But sometimes you gotta step out of that comfort zone and think differently to get a different result. So, Okay, if you want minor changes in your life, work on your behavior. If you want to make significant quantum breakthroughs, work on your paradigms, okay? So with that, cue up the video here, Deb, make sure I'm on track with this. So much of what we do in our personal lives and at the office is the result of the paradigms we hold. And what we do, in turn, affects the results we get. Thanks for coming to the meeting today, everyone. Um, the word paradigm comes from the Greek root paradigma, meaning pattern. The pattern we expect to see, or the mental image of the way things are. We see everything through the perspective of our own paradigm. If you see your industry as one where growth is impossible, how does that affect what you do every day? And what results do you think you'll get from your actions? On the other hand, suppose you saw unlimited prospects for growth in your industry. How would that change your actions? What we see, our paradigms, determine what we do, which in turn determines what we get. And unless we consciously stand apart from and examine our paradigms, we might never see that perhaps many of them are distorted, short-sighted, or just flat out wrong. <laughs> I remember a mini paradigm shift I experienced one Sunday morning on the subway in New York City, people were sitting very quietly, some reading, some resting with their eyes closed. Suddenly, 
a man and his children entered the subway car. The children ran yelling to the car, throwing things, grabbing people's newspapers. Their father sat down near me and closed his eyes and did nothing. I felt irritated. I could not believe he would let his children run wild like that. After a few minutes of patience and restraint, I turned to him and said, Sir, your children are really disturbing a lot of people. I wonder if you could control them just a little more. Yeah, you're right. I should do something. But we just came from the hospital where your mother died about an hour ago, and I guess they don't know how to handle it. Because I don't know how to handle it. Can you imagine how I felt at that moment? My paradigm shifted. Suddenly I saw things differently. And because I saw differently, I thought differently. I felt differently. I acted differently. My irritation vanished. Compassion flowed freely. I wanted to help instead of criticizing and complaining. Once you see things as they really are, you'll think, feel, and act differently. And you'll do it automatically, spontaneously. Can you see why paradigms are deeper than attitudes and behavior? If you want to make minor changes in your life, work on your behavior. But if you want to make significant quantum breakthroughs, work on your paradigms. Okay. That, um, that video is always a wake-up call, for sure. I'm going to share um, a paradigm with you, a paradigm shift for myself, and then we're going to get into some breakout rooms, and I'll have you answer some questions, okay? So about 1996, a long time ago, I was working for a newspaper um, that was owned by Knight Ritter, which was a big newspaper conglomerate at the time, and their headquarters were at the Miami Herald. And I really hadn't been off the farm very much. I just can't even put it any better. Um, and so I was pretty, pretty naive. And one of the discussions at, in, during the training in Miami was about um, whether or not it was fair to have the Ten Commandments in the courtroom. I don't know why they put us on that kind of discussion. I don't remember the context. But someone had made the comment that... Um, they, didn't, they wanted to know how it would feel if you weren't a Christian to be, wondered if you would, would receive a fair trial if you were in a courtroom and you saw the Ten Commandments. And my, my self-talk was, not everyone is a Christian. And, um, and so that was, a, that was a paradigm shift for me. I hadn't even considered that, that someone would be affected by that. So that was a... It clearly affected my, my thinking and was a paradigm shift for me. So a couple of questions. Becky will put you in, in breakout rooms. So what will happen is when I give her the go-ahead, you will be put into a room of, with about six people, and you'll have some discussion around a couple of questions I will give you. And then after about, let's say, four minutes, Becky, um, let's bring everybody back. You'll see a prompt where you can join the room, join back the group again, okay? Super simple. So here's a couple questions for you to digest in your groups, okay? Um, think of a time in your life when you experienced a paradigm shift. You maybe experienced a world change or witnessed a dramatic event or you learned new information, okay? What was the event or the circumstance and what did you learn that changed your paradigm, okay? So just think about those. Okay, so is someone willing to share with, with our group about a paradigm shift you experienced? Uh, Jody, I was in the group that I was in, we were just talking about it, and one of the participants um, said that she's learned a lot of technology and to help people who don't have the technology, they don't even have a tablet, they don't have a computer, they have a smartphone and don't have any idea how to use it. So she's been reaching out to them and helping them. And what I've noticed is this, that even though this has put a damper on our normal everyday stuff, 
I've noticed more families are out walking, they're biking, people are putting down the phone and what a refreshing sight because people are spending time with their families. They're realizing family is important. You right. know what? That phone can wait, but your family, and it's very cool. The only time I've ever seen a phone is when they pull it out and take a picture, mm -hmm. but they're not on it. And I'm, I've said too that I've noticed people aren't even driving looking at their phone, which are not supposed to anyway, but you know, they're not driving and looking at their phone. They're actually visiting to the, with the people that are in their vehicle. So that's been, to me, has been very refreshing. So if something positive has come out of this, at least in my eyes, it's that people are connecting with their families and friends. Yeah, that's a great paradigm shift. I hope that lasts. Mm -hmm, I do too. Yeah, good one. One more. Any other discussion? Well, my group didn't discuss this, um, but something I just thought of is I think a lot of people have had a big shift in how they view teachers because they're helping their own kids at home. And yeah, just, um, you know, maybe it's not <laughs> quite as easy as we all thought it was before um, because now we're trying to help our kids. and. Um, yeah, so I think there's been a big shift for a lot of people that um, maybe didn't appreciate teachers as much as they should have to begin with, and they're having a new, new appreciation. That is a good one. That's great. Well, if you if you have one you're dying to share, write it in the chat chat pod. Otherwise, we're gonna just keep continuing here. Yeah, so just quickly, um, this is called a maturity continuum. If you've gone through this, you've seen this. It's just a nice visual of all of the, um, the habits. Obviously, there's seven. Just a brief dis discussion here. Um, success is based on two things, mastery of self, okay? And um, the bottom habits are self. So we need to work on ourselves, which we call, um, and the effective relationships, which we call the public victory, which is the top half, okay? And then we fill in the rest with the maturity continuing together. So it's really important to think about dependence. Okay? And then we reach independence. But the highest form of working together is interdependence, knowing that we need each other to achieve great effectiveness. And it's really about, about personal growth and interpersonal growth. and just shows us kind of the relationship of the habits among, among themselves and how those work. All right, should we go to habit three? So we're gonna just take a little drive through since our restaurant is not open and only our drive through is open today. We are going to just take a little drive through habit three. So habit three is really in that personal growth section of that continuum. Habit three is really the physical creation of habit one and habit two. So habit one is about personal responsibility and, and habit two is really about our, our, vis our vision and mission, our own personal vision and mission. And so habit three is really putting that all to work, putting that into a, um, a workable model. So as, as we um, work with the slideshow a little bit, I am going to invite you to think of a moment. You can jot it down or just keep it in your mind, whatever works for you. I want you to think about one thing that you could do on a regular basis that you're not doing now that would make a significant difference in your work and or in your personal life. So just take a minute and think about that and we'll go from there. As Jody's looking for that, we want to think about a couple of things in habit three. We want to think about things that are important, and we want to think about things that are urgent. So important things. Important things are really those activities that represent our mission, our roles, our values, and our highest priorities. Relationships probably sit there. Um, so those things, those um, important activities are ones that we well, we have to act on. They don't act on us. Those urgent things, 
are activities that require our immediate attention. They will, they will work on us. So what Jody has up is the, what we call, and it's the tool that we use, it really is a time matrix tool. Now, those of you that have taken this before, this is a good refresher. This is always a good refresher to me. So if you look at, can we see the whole slide? What are you seeing? Um, I don't quite see the whole slide. I see part of the slide, but it's okay. We'll do it. We'll be fine. So if you look at that time matrix, ah, there we go. Perfect. You can see some, some words written at the top, urgent and not urgent. You also see some words at the side, not important and important. So when we use our time matrix, it's really not a clock that we're putting things in by the clock. What we're doing is putting it in by a compass. Where do we want to be? How do we want to spend our time? When Jody talked about our effectiveness, our effectiveness comes from where we put our most energy. So I'm just going to do go through the quadrants. We call them Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, almost everything you do in your life, your activity could probably get placed in one of these four quadrants. And so it's about where we spend our most energy. So Q1, Q1 is both important and both urgent. So those are things that they take your time. They are the COVID that happens. And now you have to just uh, within that day, change your online delivery, learn Zoom, and every other platform on the planet. Okay, those things happen. They're emergencies. They're last-minute deadlines. We will always have those, and they act on us. Q2, on the other hand, if you look to the top of Q2, it's not urgent, which means mm, it's not really bugging you all the time, but if you look to the side, it is important. So this is where effectiveness happens in our time matrix. So we have our planning. This is, the, this is the quadrant of effectiveness, our proactive work, our important goals, the thinking that we do, the planning. Q2 is the only one of our time matrix planners, and Q2 is the one that will address building relationships. None of our other quadrants do that. It's about learning and renewal, and it's about recreation and recreating recreating your energy yourself. So Q3 has some other things in it. We sometimes call Q3 distraction, or sometimes we call it the quadrant of deception. So you can see that on the side, it says things in Q3 are not important. And if you look to the top in that category, they're not urgent. They, excuse me, they're urgent. But when you look at those things in quadrant three, those things in quadrant three are oftentimes really important to someone else, someone else's urgency, not our urgency. And so it distracts us from where we want to be and takes, takes our time. Those needless interruptions, those unnecessary re reports. Now you might think, oh, my supervisor asked me to make a report and it's not that important to me. So I, uh, it's, a, it's a Q3, I'm not gonna do it. Oh, wait a minute. If your su supervisor is asking you to do it, it impacts you greatly because it impacts what happens to you. So in essence, that really is a Q1 tool and not a Q3. Q3 is about deception and distraction. Q4 is really, we can label that as waste, we can label that as excess, we can label that as avoidance. So we travel to Q4 oftentimes when we've spent too much time in Q1 on urgency. So I just had that happen to me the other day in this, all this COVID-19 stuff. As Jody said, you're just busy in a different way and mentally just, just zapped out. I went home from work one night and turned on the TV and I think the TV was on till 12 o'clock at night. And I was in Q4 because I was so exhausted in the urgency, I escaped. I escaped to Q4. Now some people might say, but wait a minute, you know, relaxation, that's in Q4. Remember Q4 is about excessiveness. 
and how that's taking our time. What am I avoiding doing by staying in Q4? So if you look at that time matrix in this slide, you see that Q2 is in blue and it's bigger than some of the other quadrants because that's where our effectiveness lies. We talk about living north, north of the line. So we wanna spend most of our time in Q2, but we always know that Q1 happened. So we're gonna do some planning. We're gonna do our proactive work. It's about personal growth. And we talk about the discipline of that because it does take some planning to do that. So there always will be things in Q1. I'm hoping that as time goes on, our Q1s will shrink a little bit and our Q2s can start to grow a little bit more. And so the more we spend in Q2, really, the less we're handling in those urgencies and, and crises and emergencies that happen because we're planning for those and we're, and we're preparing ahead of time. So that's a quick, quick drive through. So we'll, what I take from this, and I always have to remind myself, and it's a quote from our manual, and it really says, things that matter most should never be at the mercy of things that matter least. So what are the things that you, something that you put down on your little note or in your, in your mental note to yourself? What was that? What was that one most significant thing that maybe you're not doing, but it would really make a difference in your work and personal life? And if you look at those, that, time matrix, uh, I'm not sure, but I'm guessing it probably ends up in quadrant two because it's something you should do or something you want to do, but you haven't made that your focus yet. And so when we talk about those things that are important, maybe they're not urgent and acting on us, you know, we're figuring out how do we put those things in, into our life? How does that all happen? And so if you want to advance us a slide, Jody, here's a self check. So which quadrant am I in right now? Maybe most of us have been more in Q2, but maybe some of us are exhausted and we have gone to four. So it's a question, how am I doing? Why am I here? When I had to ask myself why I was wasting the whole night, the question and answer were pretty clear. I was exhausted from all the crisis. So what can I do? Go back the next day, think about my Q2 work. What can I do to get out of there if I'm not wanting to be there? How long have I been there? If I'm, if I'm in quadrant three and four a long time, that's about excess. And I need to think about how can I get back to one or two? And then what are the consequences of staying there? You know, if I feel really burned out and I'm down in that quadrant four, I'm wasting and avoiding, pretty soon I feel the stress of everything that I have to go back to do and I go back to quadrant one and I'm crazy there again until I'm burned out again. So it's the time matrix, matrix is an opportunity for us to be able to think about what do I wanna do, what's important, Maybe it's a relationship that you are needing to cultivate that you haven't, haven't paid attention to for a while. Maybe it's a focus. Maybe you're saying, you know, I just need to listen more. And so putting that in our Q2 and saying, this is important and, and providing that time and that ability to do that and the consequences of staying there. So if you wanna advance, we'll go to the rocks. So the time matrix really helps us to plan in a week's time. And you can see that the big rocks, we put the big rocks in first. Those might be things from Q1. They might be those urgent things that we have to get done, those deadlines that we might have to address. They might have to learn Zoom. Um, or it might be that planning. It might be that planning that um, I need to meet my friend um, and Skype tonight because we haven't connected for a while. Um, it's a big rock. It's important to make time for. So then you see all the little pebbles there in addition. So those little pebbles are things that I'm going to fill in, but I'm going to put the big rocks in first. 
And then if you also notice on this visual, there's little stuff at the bottom. There's pebbles that do not even go in there, that don't even fit in there. There's some things in those little pebbles that are neither important nor urgent, or they're not urgent and certainly not important, are those kinds of things that can fall by the wayside. And so we make our priorities to be able to put those kinds of things in. What this helps us to do is say no to the things that don't match with our value system, with our mission and goals, um, and to be able to have the courage sometimes to even say to somebody, I need to now get back to work and, and finish what I'm working on, or saying to somebody, I can be with you in 10 minutes after I finish providing this report to my supervisor. So it allows your ability to have flexibility, but also achieve what you want in that importance. So what's your big rock? What's your big rock for this week? What's your big rock for tonight? It's like somebody said, maybe we've become more aware of what the big rocks are in, in our life um, now that we've gone through this whole situation. All right, thanks, Deb. Um, just a couple slides on um, the emotional bank account and what this is. Um, so the emotional bank account really measures the amount of trust in a relationship. Um, really thinking about um, making deposits or withdrawals. So perhaps a deposit might be um, a compliment or sending a card to someone. Um, it's important to know the person's currency, be sincere and consistent. Oftentimes I talk about body language, tone of voice. Know your words might not be matching your actions, okay? Make sure you're sincere in the delivery. Um, make those deposits over time. Uh, remember that close relationships, um, oops, sorry, require more deposits and try not to make a withdrawal. So, you know, we think about what is a deposit? What, what would be a deposit? Somebody want to, what would, if, if I would say, I'll take you out to lunch to McDonald's, is that a deposit or a withdrawal? A deposit. Okay, thanks, Karen. For somebody else, it might be a withdrawal. Maybe going out to, the, to a sit-down restaurant would be more of a deposit. Um, so what's the difference between the golden rule and the platinum rule? So I think many of us were, were raised, you know, do unto others as you had do unto you, right? Um, but the, Dr. Covey talks about the platinum rule. And basically that's treating others the way they want to be treated. So just because you like to go to McDonald's doesn't mean someone else likes to. And it's important to, especially, you know, not only in our, in our work lives, but in our, um, our personal lives too, to be thinking about deposits. I think it was a former president who said, make friends before you need them. So I think that means don't be asking for favors if you haven't um, deposited anything or goodwill to create that relationship, okay? So some things to think about. Okay, so Deb will touch on um, habit five. So habit five is really taking what Jody talked about and putting deposits into that emotional bank account. And we do that with habit five. Habit five is part of the public victory section of that maturity continuum. And habit five is really um, about thinking about in two parts. It has two parts in terms of, first of all, seeking to understand. And the second part is really about then seeking to be understood. So the principles that we have in that are that respect, that mutual understanding, empathy, and then also the courage. Courage sometimes matched with consideration we talk about that a little bit. And so we think about that. We often think that, oh, we need to respond. We need to reply. We need to contribute. In fact, we're, we're kind of scripted for that. And, you know, oh, golly, isn't it that way with extension? Extension is like the answer place. And so when people want to know the answer to their question, we just give them the answer to the question. 
And sometimes that's very appropriate, but sometimes people are requiring a little bit deeper amount of understanding. Um, one agent shared the other day that there was a person that was calling um, this particular agent with kind of an off the wall question. And it came to be that really that person was just reaching out for some connection and a little bit of understanding. So we sometimes have to decipher, you know, are we first seeking to understand? That's kind of hard to do. Um, and so we think about, if you wanna to go to the next slide, Jody, we think about what gets in the way of listening. If it's, if it's my hubby and it's our anniversary, it's a withdrawal. Don, say more about that. Can we go back to that? Just when you said, um, if someone asks you to McDonald's, is it a withdrawal or a deposit? It <laughs> depends on the situation. That's a good my point. husband loves McDonald's and that would not impress me if it was our anniversary. Excellent point. I'm but, sorry, I didn't see that before. But no, that's okay. But if it was a friend, yeah, it would definitely be a different situation. <laughs> Good point. Yeah, great. Thank you for that. Sorry about the interruption there. That's okay. Yeah, Deb. So if Becky's willing to, to um, Deb will give the assignment if she's willing to put us in breakout rooms. So just have just a brief discussion, maybe three minutes. and. And just talk about, you know, this first part of this habit is seeking to understand and part of understanding is listening. And so what, what gets in the way of our listening? You know, and when that happens, what are the results? So I hope you had some good discussion about what gets in the way of listening. Um, sometimes just our own story gets in the way of listening. Sometimes our paradigms get in the way um, of listening. And so one of the ways and one of the tools that we use in Seven Habits to start to pay more attention to our um, first part of this habit, seeking to understand, is really about using empathic listening. And so Jody, if you wanna advance our slide, so this is always a good reminder for me because I, you know, I teach this habit and it seems like we kind of gravitate to the habits that maybe we want to work more on. So this is one of the habits I do have to keep working on. And so it's always a good reminder. There's actually two parts to that listening that we do, the two parts to that empathic listening that we do with people and it's our intent and our skill and so you can see on the slide that intent, the intent is bigger and so because you know we as humans take a lot of nonverbal cues from each other listening you know the part of that the biggest part of that is really our intent we might mess it up a little bit we might get into our own story we might be tempted to advise or evaluate, we might be tempted to do that. But the biggest part about empathic listening is really our intent. Are you showing people your, your intent? Um, and especially now, um, it seems like that a lot of people want to know that somebody is listening and that somebody understands them. You know, how, how do we do that? And so if you go to the next slide, Jody. Here's some empathic listening tips. So focus on your intent. Don't worry about the correct response. So we talk in seven habits about listening, but not with the intent to reply, only to focus on that other person's story. We talk about listening to their story and not getting stuck in our autobiographical story of ourselves, because we talked about that at the very beginning. We have that, that paradigm. I look at the world through a certain lens. If I'm giving you advice and answering or evaluating through my lens, it might not be your lens. So focusing on your intent. And as Dr. Lardy said, yeah. don't be afraid of silence. Because sometimes people have to think a little bit. Sometimes people have to make sure that what they're gonna say to you feels like something safe to say to you. So, being comfortable with that silence and having those 
those few extra minutes. Um, I read a saying the other day, and I think it's one I'm going to put in my head. Um, and it went like this, your intent walks into the room before you. Meaning we bring our intent when we're interacting with other people. And if our intent is to be an empathic listener, we're well on the road to be doing that. So it's really about getting that view of another, that paradigm and understanding that. And so the next slide just gives us some of the skills. And if you think about that, um, for time today, we won't go back in your breakout room, but if you think about this, um, that person too is the response. How do you respond empathically? You reflect those feelings, you reflect those words, you reflect the feelings and, and the words, and you, you check back in whether, you're, whether you have that understanding. So how do you know if somebody has felt that they're understood? You know, we often try to use empathic listening, especially with a person who's emotional, or it may be in a situation where we're not exactly agreeing with that person, or somebody calls into your office on the phone and they're distressed about something. Empathic listening is the first place to go so that you're really understanding what, they're, what, what their feelings are, what their words are, because sometimes the feelings and the words are different. They're asking the questions, but the feelings are saying something else. When that person is calmed down, um, you can see and see or hear in their in their tone of voice or their body language if you're face to face. Um, when that's calmed down, maybe then they're going to be in that position that they'll take your advice or listen to that evaluation, and it's completely appropriate. Um, but the other part of this habit, the other great part of this habit is, you know, when we make sure that somebody else is understood and they felt like they're understood and that we see through their eyes, they're more likely to listen to what we have to say. So it's a two-part habit, but it really works together and works in conjunction with that. I wonder, Go ahead. Could we hear a couple examples of what the breakout rooms discussed? Sure. Someone willing to share something? Cindy. Yep, I will. In our breakout room, one of the things that gets in the way of listening is a shortage of time. So we're crunched for time, we're in a hurry. And then what happens as a result of that, mistakes or things get left undone. Another barrier is preconceived ideas. Um, we, we already have our own thoughts about what can or should be done or how it should be done. And then, you know, as a result of that, we kind of maybe have an unwillingness to you know, do it another way or do something else that wasn't our preconceived idea. We maybe voice it and it comes out wrong, doesn't sound good, and it looks like you know, we're not willing to work together, be a nice, you know, make it work as a team. And the other last thing that we talked about was if we're preoccupied, we're just distracted and our mind is wandering, we're thinking about 16,000 other things other than what really is the topic on the table. So we're not focused and then we have, we miss it. We miss the details. We have to have some repetition or people have to say it again. Then feelings can get hurt because you weren't listening to me. And, it, you know, it's a vicious circle. I think your second point sounded something like a paradigm. What you see leads to what you do, then leads to what you get. It's the old adage, you get what you put into it, into that conversation. And oftentimes in Seven Habits, we talk about if a conversation's not going well, then change how you're communicating, whether that's talking or listening. You know, I, I often reference the definition of insanity, doing something again and again, and wondering why we're not getting a different result. So if that conversation isn't going well, maybe think about handling it differently or listening. Um, one of the videos that's included in here is kind of a silly one, and you can find it on YouTube. It's called The Nail. And uh, there's a, a man and a woman discussing. She has a problem, and he just wants to fix it. And sometimes, as we know, as human beings, we just want to be heard. But don't forget about the listening part of the equation. We talk about that as being heart commerce in that listening and understanding. And really is a part to that other piece. The other pieces in the maturity continuum are the synergy and working together 
and, and thinking win-win. So we have to have that understanding um, to have that public growth from that maturity continuum. Today, on um, as I had referenced, the app, the Seven Habits app, today's, it's not called a devotional, but they call them a daily booster. And it's just a snippet from one of the habits. Today's booster is if you really seek to understand without hypocrisy and without guile, there will be times when you will be literally stunned with the pure knowledge and understanding that will flow to you from another human being. It isn't even always necessary to talk in order to empathize. In fact, sometimes words may just get in your way. And this is habit five, seek first to understand, then be understood. Okay. So the last habit is habit seven. It's the habit of self-renewal. And again, I have the slide of the maturity continuum. And habit seven encompasses obviously all seven habits. It makes the rest of them possible. Okay. And the piece that we didn't include, which I think is really powerful, is the short video about the golden goose. And Deb um, talks about that so well. Um, we don't want to kill the goose. Okay. You know, it's the old fable of um, the goose that laid the golden egg and the farmer was so impatient and killed the goose to get all the golden eggs. Well, he killed the, go the, gold the goose that laid the golden egg and there was no more. So we have to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves so we can take care of others. If you've ever been on an airplane and the flight attendant tells you to first put the oxygen mask on yourself before you can help others. Okay. So I love the video for um, Sharp and the Saw. I won't play it all. We'll just play the beginning of it because I think it drives home a pretty important point. What you doing? See, I'm still on firewood. Must be pretty tired. I am. How long have you been sawing? Two, three hours. I think that's ready to be beat. Yeah, I am. Saw must be pretty dull by now. Why don't you stop and sharpen the saw? Because I'm too busy sawing. Habit seven is the principle of renewal. There's an inescapable principle of nature in physics. It's called the second law of thermodynamics, entropy. In other words, everything breaks down. So we need to consistently rebuild or renew to keep things from breaking down. Often we neglect the mind until it becomes dull, the spirit until it becomes insensitive. We neglect our most cherished relationships until they turn cold. We neglect the body until we get sick and incapacitated. The metaphor of sharpening the saw represents your commitment to preserve and enhance the greatest asset you have, you. Whether or not we sharpen the saw affects the quality of our work, our productivity, our overall sense of satisfaction in life. It affects the quality of our relationships and the quality of our decision making. Habit seven is a challenge for many because it lies in quadrant two, where things are vitally important, but not urgent. And that's why most people neglect it. They may do it unsystematically. They hit and miss on it. Often they get out of balance, focusing on only one dimension of their lives, like diet or exercise. Sharpening the saw has four dimensions, the body, the mind, the spirit, and the heart. Okay, I'm just gonna pause right there. So I think this is an important one. Um, Dr. Covey talks about you know, obviously taking care of yourself before you can take care of others. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, what stops us from, from renewing? Like he said, he mentioned one, um, you know, maybe it's, uh, we just focus on diet or, you know, one of the quadrants. Um, what, what stops us from renewing? 
what's some excuses? Anybody want to type in the chat or just turn your mic on? Too busy, yeah, for sure. Not enough time. Sometimes we can get into a rut. Um, feeling unworthy, okay. Yep, good ones. Yeah, some are finding it. Okay, so um, I'm curious if you can find the text, this, the, the T, and um, if you would type in, how do, how do you renew physically? Do you go for walks or socially? Do you still call people? And if you're willing to use that text annotation on the top, and it will create, um, so I'll go ahead and write right on here. Walking, okay, walks, yeah, good. Anybody else? How about mental or spiritual? Okay, good job. You guys are finding the annotations. Make time for silence. Boy, that's important, isn't it? Riding your, riding your horse, okay. How about social or emotional? We're kind of social distancing now, so how are people finding an opportunity to socially recharge? Calling a friend, okay. A Zoom meeting with friends, it doesn't have to be just for work, that's for sure. Great work, driveway visits. Riding bike, all of these things I need to do. I need to get my bike out of the shed. Great, awesome work. Our weather has turned around and it's been awfully easy to spend time outside in the evenings. Till the mosquitoes hit, of course. Reading, listening to more podcasts. I find myself doing more of that too. Okay, good. So if anything, take time at, at this very interesting time that we're in to think about renewal. Renewal of yourself. I, have, I know many of you are trying to educate children at home and keep current with your own work and um, be mindful of things happening. So um, YouTube sermons, I like that. I've not, not watched that, that's great. Don't forget to do these things, even if it's five or 10 minutes. Um, like uh, Deb had referenced, it fits in quadrant two. It's not urgent but it's important. And if you don't do it, it will become urgent. You are the goose. You are the goose, that's right. We're all in this together and we can't do it without you. Yeah. So um, closing thoughts, um, Becky just wanted to make sure that all of you knew about some references she has in the reference library. So Becky, do you wanna tell everybody about that? Yes, we really don't keep up the staff resource library anymore because it's so easy now to download your own podcast or watch YouTube or whatever, but we have some golden oldies literally in the staff resource library that if anybody wants to use. And what made me think of it is the whole quadrants Covey calls first things first. And we have this little booklet. If anybody would like to borrow that, we can ship it out to you, although it's probably mostly online now too. But it came with a whole program, but not everybody will be able to watch these because anybody remember VHS? <laughs> if you still have a VHS player, you are welcome to borrow these. And even better, we must have given away the books at fall conference when we had a table out and everybody could take things. But if you still have a cassette player, here's Seven Habits on Cassette. <laughs> so you are very welcome to contact me and borrow those. Um, I do, though, I'm pretty sure, I couldn't find it while we were talking today, but I'm pretty sure Deb Tanner created a quadrant thing that we used in EdCom. We've used this several times. And so I'll just send that to everybody who is registered for this breakout because that alone I, I really enjoyed the refresher. Since I've been through the three-day version, I really enjoyed the refresher, but especially the quadrants. And that's the one that I know I've been able to apply to my life. Is this urgent, important? Where does it fit? And it helped me prioritize my time. So I'll just send that to everybody if you find that useful. 
Thanks, Becky. I think if you have a VHS player or a cassette player. Make it old school, I like it. <laughs> all right, that's all we have. We appreciate your time this afternoon and um, allowing us to spend some time with all of you. Deb, anything else? I just want to thank everybody for everything that you're doing because you are you are the pieces that hold everything together. So we we appreciate it. Thank you. All right, thank you, Jody and Deb. And thank you all for attending the first virtual support staff conference. Many thanks to the planning committee, Robbie Hopkins, Haley Migland, Mickey Mertz, Kelly Stirr, and especially Becky Koch and Elizabeth Cronin. And uh, for all of your help, ideas, and willingness to make this conference possible. So thank you again, committee. And thanks to our keynote speakers, Jill Nelson, Christina Astrup, Jody Bruns, and Deb Thayer. And remember to check out all the great recordings of what would have been breakouts at the conference. Um, just go to any NDSU Extension webpage and Google Support Staff Conference. Thank you to everybody who recorded a video for us as well. And uh, that's it. Thank you for joining us this week. Stay safe, stay safe and happy spring. Mm -hmm.